So yeah, um, we talk about radiation effects on charge-based memory bit cells. Um, uh, the lecture is divided into, let's say, two major parts. The first one is up until point number five, uh, where I give more or less an overview of what is going on, of uh, the basic principles, and basically how to discuss even the topic of basically reliability of memory bit cells, in particular non-volatile memory bit cells. And then we have a second part that is, um, uh, the first part, is, in the second part at the beginning, there's uh, the experiment of under irradiation, let's say. And then at the end, I added this year, this is new, so let's see how it goes. Uh, 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 let's say some sort of exercise that is more technical, let's say, um, in order to understand, uh, let's say, the concepts that we have seen at the beginning of the talk. So at the beginning of the talk, we talk about what does it mean, reliability, some definitions, and then in the, especially in point number seven, there is, the point number seven would be, I think, the longest section. Uh, we do an exercise on how to prove these specifications, let's say. Okay, so uh, we start. We have the time today, so I will take it fairly slow. Um, okay, so I think we all more or less know non-volatile memories, at least from a concept point of view. They are used in all electronics, so whenever you basically have electronics, you also need to have some sort of memory device in order to store your data. Um, in particular, the definition for non-volatile memory is that it retains the data after the power is shut down in opposition to volatile memories, in particular, for example, RAMs. Um, and uh, there are a lot of fields in which these are used from, let's say, the SD card in your phone to the, um, let's say, small memories that needs to store the calibration of a LED inside the sensors of your car. Uh, would be nice to see the pointer. Laser pointer, yes. So the sensors in uh, the, the time of flight sensors in your car. Of course, many more applications, but let's say this is just uh, to give an introduction. Okay, so two main words in this field, endurance and data retention. Uh, when we talk about endurance, we talk about how many times we can write and, re and, and erase the data from the memory and then be able to read the data stored correctly after this uh, operation. And the second topic is data retention. So after a write operation, how long will it be possible to recover the data that we saved inside the memory itself? I added some numbers just for reference. So for example, in the flash in your phone, very commonly we talk about uh, 10,000, 100,000 rewrite uh, cycles of uh, program and arrays. Uh, and typically, more or less for all memories, we talk about a data retention of 10 years after uh, the, as a service lifetime of your device. Uh, remember these two concepts because it will come up again later, especially in the last part of the presentation. Then we discuss a little bit more about, instead, specifically the radiation effects. So when we talk about radiation effects, we talk about three major topics. The first one is single event effects, basically. So mm, in particular, we have a high ionizing particles, a particle that passes through material and is possible to transfer energy to this material and generate spikes in current and voltage. And the second one is the total ionizing dose. And in particular, this holds its value mostly with 
photons. So we have X-rays or gamma rays, so in space, but also in avionics, where we have a certain amount of energy deposited by the photons inside uh, our silicon and uh, electronics in general. And this generates an accumulation of charge that then generates a shift in the characteristics of our device. Much worse than this is displacement damage. So essentially, much similarly to single event effects, we have one heavy, let's say, uh, particle, uh, a proton or uh, uh, the nucleus of uh, an atom that passes through uh, the silicon and it's possible basically to destroy the lattice of silicon by uh, removing one of the silicon atoms in the lattice and basically thus uh, changing the, the properties of our silicon substrate. Okay, so as we were saying before, just a quick uh, overview of how a non-volatile memory, non memory usually is structured in particular charge-based, because then we see also other types, but we focus mostly on charge-based. Uh, we have our cell array where we hold our bit cells, our stored one and zeros in the form of physical quantities, in particular in charge-based, it's an accumulation of charge. Uh, a decoder in order to reconstruct the information from the physical quantity to a one or zero. And then buffers, input-output, and uh, charge pump. This will be important later because um, specifically for programming and erasing these charge-based bit cells, usually we need voltages that are very specific to the uh, application. And uh, so we need usually a voltage generator on chip. And then we have a general controller of the overall chip. So a brief overview of non-volatile memory devices. So um, uh, I guess you all know the concept of floating gate, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 okay. So floating gate, we pass through this quite a bit now because this is the core of the industry essentially, and it has been for some time now a lot has been developed in order to surpass this concept, but this, uh, for, a, let's say, educational purposes, is still very valid. And then we have uh, the second type, that is what my work focuses on the most, that is charge trapping devices, where instead of storing our charge inside a um, conductive layer, that is this floating gate here, we store it in traps that are uh, accumulated into um, poor oxides, essentially, and in, the, in particular, silicon nitride. So these yellow stripes are usually silicon oxide, um, and the silicon nitride is a poorer oxide compared to the silicon uh, dioxide uh, and has thus more defects that can accumulate charge. And we can, we can use this to accumulate charge in our uh, memory device. Then there are other concepts. Um, I have a couple of slides regarding this in order for you to have an overview of what is the alternative to all this. It's not my field, so I'm not entirely uh, able to explain it to you if you have questions, but we can go more in detail if you like. And in particular, let's say uh, the example depicted here is uh, uh, a magnetic RAM. Uh, is not a RAM, it's called a RAM, but it's not a RAM, uh, because it's a non-volatile device, and where basically instead of the physical quantity that stores the information in magnetic RAMs is the orientation of dipoles um, within uh, magnetic layers, essentially. So the red stripe and the green stripe that you see in the picture over there. Uh, there is a way through a high current to revert the polarity of one of the two layers and depending on the agreement of the polarities or disagreement of the polarities, we have a, uh, either a more resistive or less resistive con conductive path, let's say, and thus we can reconstruct the information uh, via a 
current. Okay, so we focus on floating gate, as I said before, and we start with floating gate. Okay, so uh, just going fairly quickly across all this, since it seems that we all more or less know these concepts. Um, in the floating gate device, we have is basically a regular transistor where we have a charge storage. Basically, it's a transistor where here you see the basic structure. So here you have the gate and here drain and source. In addition to this, we have on top a control gate that isolates, let's say, that is also conductive, but the gate of our basic transistor is completely isolated from external. And so the basic storage of charge inside this floating gate is exactly what changes the characteristic of your transistor, essentially. And uh, the second part that is very important in these floating gate devices is the uh, capacitive coupling from the control gate to the substrate of your device, because the uh, series of these two transistors so CPP and CB is, all the others are parasitics and are also important, but essentially these two are, let's say, determine the ratio of control and the characteristic of your device. So what happens when we introduce charge in our transistors? So you see down here an energy band diagram. So you see a, a let's say semiconductor here, semiconductor here, semiconductor here. Usually this is actually metal one, or it can happen to be metal one, but it doesn't matter. And we see instead high uh, energy barriers uh, determined by the silicon oxide. So you have pockets of uh, valence inside this energy uh, diagram that can, uh, if, uh, a charge uh, element, so an electron, uh, gets stored inside this element, uh, cannot escape, essentially, uh, because of the barriers that we introduced with uh, silicon oxides. Okay. How to do this? So how do we insert charge into this scheme? There are two ways mainly used by, uh, let's say, that make use of two different physical effects. The first one is essentially um, accelerating the electrons uh, with a high current in our transistor channel. And when the electrons have enough kinetic energy, there is a certain probability that the electron will uh, be subject by a, a deviation in direction. And given the fact that it has a high kinetic energy, can overcome this energy barrier because it simply sits right up here and not at the lowest possible values due to the high current. The second one that is trickier um, is the Fowler-Nordheim effect. Uh, that is a quantum mechanic effect that basically uh, states that if we have a very high voltage uh, difference between our uh, floating gate and drain in this case, if I'm correct, yeah, sure. Um, then there is a certain bend of this energy barrier and this determines essentially a thinning of the uh, energy barrier and there is a certain probability that these electrons, even if they don't have enough energy to pass, enough kinetic energy to pass through, they have anyway a certain probability to pass through this energy barrier. If you see, so these two effects have very different um, efficiencies and uh, have very different uh, quantities that they depend to. So essentially, the channel hot electron injection depend on a high current from in our transistor, so power, but is also quicker in principle. Uh, whereas here we have a much more efficient system uh, that uh, takes advantage of this quantum mechanic property. Um, 
so is less in power but is also slower and actually this uh, Faulenordheim tunneling over here has another drawback that is not immediate from this plot that is that this process is destructive, always destructive to some extent. This as well, mostly for thermal, th thermal regions and also trapping for, for a certain extent, but this is worse. Okay, so um, again, uh, we more or less already discussed this, but just going quickly. Uh, we're talking about a floating gate device. We can store charge inside the floating gate. By storing charge inside the floating gate, in particular electrons, it means that before managing, so we, the effect, the net effect that we obtain is that we shift the voltage threshold of our device. Because essentially, I will go back just for a moment. Let's take this. Um, if you have negative charge over here, through this capacitive coupling, you need to first compensate from, uh, if you control this transistor from the control gate, you need to first compensate the charge inside the floating gate before being able to switch on your transistor correctly. Okay, and so here you see, for example, that we have a voltage threshold shift, and more importantly, if I take a gate voltage right here, we see that we can reconstruct immediately our information correctly because this transistor over here will not conduct current and this transistor over here on the left will instead conduct current. And so we have a read window. Remember this read window concept because it will be important later. Um, another thing that I want to highlight immediately in this slide also, it's not immediately evident, maybe I can write a line the next time that I give this lecture, uh, is that there is one point to pay specific attention to in this talk, and is the difference between voltage threshold shift and in general voltage threshold and reading current that we discussed right now. So if we take a certain voltage, we have a reading current, an active current in our investigation, uh, and these two concepts uh, give the same result. So if we investigate voltage threshold, we can identify a window, and so we can identify a programmed or an erased uh, cell. But if we, uh, and we do the same also with the reading current, but the voltage threshold gives us, in general, more information about the characteristic of the device, whereas the reading current depends on the reading voltage that you apply here on this X, axis. And so you see two different, so you will see across this talk two different style of plots. One that has on the x-axis the voltage threshold, and so if you see here you have a high voltage threshold that is after a program operation, and here have you have a low voltage threshold that is basically uh, a cell that does not have charge inside the floating gate. But you can also see a uh, different style of plot, where instead on the x-axis you have a current, and these two distributions are flipped, because then at the given voltage you have that the distribution closer to zero, let's say, will be the one with uh, programmed cells, so with a charge accumulated in the floating gate, whereas on the right you will have the uh, cell without any charge. Uh, that gives a reading current that is considerably higher. So, yeah, one concept to pay attention across this talk. Um, okay, let's go over this quickly. There are two main architectures uh, in floating gate devices. One is the NOR and one is the NAND. There are mm, some advantages and disadvantages in each of these. Uh, in particular, in the NOR structure of the array of bit cells, so you can see here the individual cells. This is usually be usually more robust because you can access individual cell and every individual cell is independent from the other um, and has a higher reliability, but it's considerably less scalable because all these interconnect generate uh, uh, an overhead in area. In area. Whereas here you have a much more compact structure because you don't have so many uh, cross metal contacts to access pit lines. But at the same time, if you see 
all the transistors here are in cascade. And so if you have a failure in one of these transistors, you could have a failure of the whole line. And uh, so this means a lower reliability and a higher scalability. Okay, let's start investigate a little bit of our radiation effects. So we started from the introduction, analyzed a little bit the floating gate. Let's see what happens if we bombard our chips with fun hammers. Um, okay, so the first effect is the total ionizing dose. If you recall the uh, definition that I gave at the beginning, the total ionizing dose mainly comes from photons, not only, but also from, uh, mainly from photons. And it determines a deposition of, of energy inside your uh, device that can, of course, excite your electrons. And as we stated before, excitement of electrons and giving them kinetic energy can determine overcoming these potential barriers. Um, what happens when we uh, then have a high total ionizing dose in our, uh, our non-volatile memory devices? We have that uh, generally this is general for total ionizing dose, but also for aging. This will be important later. We have that our uh, cells that store charge, note that now here we have reading current and not anymore voltage threshold, tend to go back, the, distrib the overall distribution tend to go back to the distribution without any charge stored in the floating gate. And this is because if we deposit uh, energy in our uh, device, the electrons that are stored inside uh, our uh, floating gate, let's say, or storing mechanism, let's take the floating gate for now, can gain energy uh, and escape this, um, this floating gate. This is actually, uh, the way that I described it, this describes mostly only effect three, so photo emission, so our electrons gain energy due to a photon and then escape them. There are actually others, uh, because, for example, some positive charges or holes in our substrate can also gain energy and either be trapped or detrapped from the silicon oxide that has a better quality compared to silicon nitride but still has defects and could accumulate some charge in the uh, traps or also uh, charge injection and so essentially given these traps you can have that some of these uh, electrons could gain enough energy to jump from the floating gate first to the trap and then from the trap to wherever else, either the control gate or the bulk. Uh, interestingly, uh, this is the next slide. This is a very linear uh, relationship. So your variation in voltage threshold given by the deposited charge of the total ionizing dose or variation of charge given by the total ionizing dose is linear and is very simple. And so what we can do actually sometimes with these devices is actually taking this as an advantage and use them as dosimeters. So instead of taking this as a negative effect, so yes, these floating gates can lose charge and can lose information. But if we preload them with charge and then put them in a uh, radiation active environment, they can also measure uh, the amount of radiation deposited in our device. I don't want to go too much into details into these plots. There are many styles. This is one uh, uh, example proposed by this reference over here that is basically the variation of current determines a variation of frequency of uh, VCO, a voltage controlled oscillator, and instead over here you just rely on the variation of voltage threshold of your device. Okay, the second part, single event effects now, so we can have proton, neutrons, alpha particles and heavy ions, uh, and here uh, we have a similar, let's say, uh, these are more destructive operations compared to total ionizing dose usually, but uh, 
uh, we have a different quantity usually used in the industry for characterizing these effects, and it's the linear energy transfer over here. Uh, over here, yes. And uh, But luckily, we still maintain an almost linear correlation between the energy transfer from the particle to your device and the variation in voltage shift. And if you, let's say, uh, have a certain particle that holds a certain energy, you can see, for example, generate from our distribution, again, we changed again, here voltage threshold, um, we can see that the shift and the second peak that is created in uh, the distribution that suffers a lot of single event effects uh, can uh, be directly correlated to the linear energy transfer of your particles, of the particles that you're using uh, for the test. Of course, mm, this is not all, it's not perfect one-to-one, -one, so there are many secondary effects, so you can have that actually one, let's say, you don't have only the effect of loss of charge from here to here, you can have all the multiple steps in between, because a hitting particle uh, incident to your device can have a first collision where it loses part of its energy and then a second collision, and this creates then all the states in between. There are ways to model this, luckily. Um, in particular, one of the cases is the uh, generation of a transient leakage path. Actually, I will take make use of the board for this just for a moment, because I didn't draw this on PowerPoint and I think it might help. So if we have our floating gate, device okay uh, it would be possible for a particle then to hit this device and then generate a whole uh, a whole electron pair across its track this is a typical of a single event effect and in particular we would be interested in the silicon oxide to the bulk And suddenly, from a silicon oxide that should not be a conductor, we have a free charge excited by this effect that generates a transient current across your device. And since this should be isolated, and you have many negative charge here, then suddenly you could have a loss of a temporary loss of charge through this temporary path. Um, okay. Okay, very nice, good to know. Uh, so you see here, we have a transient current passing through your silicon oxide. Uh, this is not perfect uh, because of two things. The first thing that you should take into account is uh, the incidence of your particle. So of course, uh, the angle at which your particle hits your uh, silicon determines the length of the and the probability of this transient leakage path forming. But also as a theory, this is not perfect and sometimes does not cover all the effects that are involved in this. But it's a good way if you want to simulate one of these effects. Okay, now we discussed mostly about the cell array, so what happens in case of single event upsets and the total ionizing dose inside your bit cells, but never forget that you have surrounding circuitry in your system, especially the charge pump that is necessary to program or erase your device, so to insert or remove charge from your device, and of course also the decoders over here. Uh, I'll give you just a simple example here because uh, I'm not an expert in this field. I mostly focus on the cell array. But let's say here you find a reference. If you have that your um, generation voltage generation circuit, in particular the charge pump in your circuit, after 
uh, a certain amount of total ionizing dose deposited cannot generate enough uh, the correct voltage for your program, of course you obtain a program fail and it's the same as your whole memory is failing. So this is in general never to forget. This concept of the surrounding circuitry is will be also important later, uh, in part at least for defining a failure. Uh, but now we can go on. Okay, so let's take a look at some alternative uh, charge-based bit cells, in particular charge trapping bit cells. Okay, so uh, we started from a floating gate device, that is this you can see on the bottom left, uh, and then we pass the first idea was not very recent, I think the end of the 90s, middle of the 90s, something like this, is the Sonos structure, uh, the name uh, nomen omen, how, it's how you say it, uh, silicon oxide, nitride oxide silicon, uh, and uh, you can see that actually previously at this, at least in this example, uh, you had ono composite dielectric, so oxide, nitride oxide, um, also in your floating gate structure. So by eliminating completely your floating gate, you have just a simple dielectric stack, oxide, nitride, oxide, and we can use then the traps in this oxide uh, to uh, accumulate charge via the same physics mechanism that we discussed at the beginning. So channel out electron effect and fowler dime. This is not the only concept. I think it's the most easier to understand at, the, at this stage, but there are others. The other one that was developed actually earlier than this Sonos structure is instead of using a continuous um, um, floating gate poly strip uh, to act as your charge storage mechanism, uh, the first development was to use silicon nanocrystals, so a set of small conductive pockets in which you st to store your charge. Um, but of course, let's say these silicon nanocrystals have a minimum dimension and the same scalability problems that we had with this structure, considering that here we are using metal one, you have the same going down in structure with this. One thing that I didn't mention, that I will mention now, is that the scalability problem comes from the fact that the channel, you can get the channel as short as you like, close to the minimum distance of your technology, but the point is the capacitive coupling of this stack over here, and this is much harder to uh, scale compared to the length of your basic transistor. And so the risk is that uh, um, by reducing the length of your channel and still maintaining these distances over here, the capacitive coupling that you create with the stack is less and less efficient and a small variation of a bunch of electrons could create huge differences and thus also less reliability. A different concept uh, is this one over here. Uh, it, this is an NROM device that is very similar to the Sonos with only one difference. Instead of storing the charge across the overall traps in your nitride, you uh, can selectively decide where to store your charge in the stack. Um, and so you can create pockets of uh, charge accumulated into this device. And considering that the, when you switch on a transistor and you select a drain or a source, the profile of the charge in your, let's see if it works. Yep. So even with the floating gate, let's say if I switch your device from this side, we will have uh, an accumulation of electrons in this direction. So we have a channel bent in this direction. Uh, whereas if I decide to revert this mechanism, so here we take the source and here we take the drain, 
then we have an accumulation, the channel is bent in the other direction, and so we have an accumulation of electrons in this direction. What does it mean? That the remaining section of channel that is not very that is not very uh, rich in uh, carriers uh, the, is the most important factor in determining the conductivity of your device. And so if you have charge stored locally, I will dirty myself horribly. Well, okay, fine. Ah, thanks. Yeah, perfect. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so if you have an accumulation of charge in this specific section, uh, then you can influence the conductivity of your device by only influence this area of the channel. And so, so if we go back here, you see, we obtained, with a single transistor, we obtained a two-bit storage mechanism. So thus, even in, in uh, increasing considerably the scalability of our system. Uh, this is what I study instead, very similar to the Enron device, with a little bit of a manufacturing difference. Uh, this was a patent deposited by IBM, I think, that then shifted to uh, AMS Osram when we bought the process, essentially. Um, in here, instead of using a specific stack of oxide, nitride oxide layers, we use the passivation spacers that are beside uh, standard manufacturing transistors, essentially. And so instead of having a regular transistor that you see down here, this is a regular transistor, we decide not to have uh, an, um, an overlapped gate over the channel, but the gate in this case is underlapped. And so our passivation spacers here, the charge that we could store in here, could influence these areas in the same way as we discussed for the NROM. Um, okay, so let's discuss this for a moment. Uh, this is a basic, it's not much different from a floating gate device, so in the way that you would use it. And so we use both channel of electron and fallen or dime effects to program and erase, depending on the efficiency of the, this is very, um, application specific, let's say in our case for our processes this was the most convenient. Uh, and so the program can be more selective and the arrays is usually a mass arrays and we use this different mechanism then for read and write. We don't, we actually don't use it uh, as a symmetric device, so the device that you see here does not represent reality. Usually we try to have different flavors of these devices so that are asymmetrical, for example, with the use of a halo or uh, with uh, one side uh, the overlapped gate and on the other side an underlapped gate in order to improve the efficiency of all these operations. But this is, um, how to say this, um, subsequent optimization. The basic concepts remain the same anyway. Uh, okay. Okay, so just a brief overview of non-charge-based bit cells, and then if you like, we can also have a, a short break. Uh, the first one, okay, so this is interesting, so we can, all these charge-based devices, we have seen one thing, that for example, in particular for uh, all of these radiation effects that are subject of depositing charge or creating spikes in current and voltages exactly where we wouldn't like them to be, um, the, we can go much further than this in terms of uh, reliability. And so, for example, into by, by using storage mechanisms that are not subject to charge variation in our, um, 
in our oxides essentially so for example for the magnetic rams uh, dipoles the dipole orientation are subject uh, only to strong currents and this seldom happens with uh, with uh, radiation events and so this means that uh, this storage mechanism is inherently more robust compared to a charge based mechanism the same goes for a phase change pixel over here where basically we use uh, this i didn't mention before but i can explain it briefly now actually let's do this so in phase change devices we could have we could influence the state of a uh, um, layer of material in particular calcogenides are used uh, that can be either amorphous or crystalline and the uh, crystalline structure of this material determines the conductivity of the material itself and so by changing the um, crystalline structure of the material and this is used with via again high currents um, we can change the behave the electrical behavior of the mechanism but the fact that we are structuring this mm, the, the we are storing our information into a mechanism that depends on the crystalline structure means that we will be much less influenced by total ionizing dose one thing i will add before going on to the next step that i didn't mention before Okay, so we've seen here this transient leakage path for single event effects. So the change from a floating gate to a charge trapping mechanism into these layers has another benefit and that and is that if one of these uh, transient leakage path is created, then we do not have one single conductive uh, storage mechanism where all the charge is free to move but we have a um, storage mechanism of charge that is based on charge trapping so if one of these transient uh, leakage paths is, is created the reliability of this device is higher because essentially we lose less charge because the char our charge is stored into a dielectric behavior sorry Okay, so let's pass to the more uh, applied uh, part of the talk. So how to structure an experiment on total ionizing dose into non-volatile memory devices. In particular, I work with sidewall spacers, so you know how it works. We, um, uh, I programmed these bit cells with various programming conditions. In particular, I kept the voltages generated by the charge pump and in this particular case by the tester constant and I varied only the amount of time in which I'm applying the pulse to program. And so if you see, if we at the beginning we have a distribution of current in this case, which is over here, by applying different uh, programming pulses, we obtain certain um, reading windows so a certain difference between the peak of fresh cells so non-programmed cells and the peak instead of programmed cells that has a higher voltage threshold but a reduced uh, drain current when switched on okay so the concept of the reading window again so we see this fresh device over here this is a direct measurement we apply a 550 microsecond program to it something happens we store charge we increase our voltage threshold and thus we have a difference uh, a different characteristic of our transistor okay and this is the preparation of our devices now to the irradiation part we go into the irradiation tube. In particular, for this experiment, I used a uh, tungsten tube uh, for X-rays. So we used X-rays, and we take a look at two different concepts here. On the left, you see 
the read current of a program operation after a program operation. And on the right, you see only the reading window. So in particular, in this case, is the difference between the um, a non-programmed cell and a programmed cell sitting right next to each other. For this experiment, we were using a product with a differential bit cell structure. And so the difference between these two cells, the reading window between these two cells was the most important thing. Actually, uh, this will become more apparent later, but let's, let's keep it this way for now. Um, so this is very important, of course, but what did we say at the beginning? We said at the beginning that the total ionizing dose as the effect of shifting the uh, device in which you store charge, the, the voltage threshold of the device in which you store charge, back at its original state, because essentially it's losing the charge that was stored. So the analysis of only the side that has been programmed could give in itself uh, already some information. Of course, uh, you lose, especially in a differential, uh, differential bit cell architecture, you lose the, all the um, uh, neighboring effects. So you are neglecting the fact that these two transistors are sitting next to each other. And so all the uh, parasitics, mm, sorry, uh, all the process variations uh, that are if you take only one value for the current for analyzing this picture, are neglected then. Uh, and this would be a benefit, of course, of the differential structure. But this, I think, is clear. Instead, by taking this, we have a more clearer picture. We could see that the current difference remains above zero for a very high level of total ionizing dose. So usually here, just to give you an example, maybe Alicia, you can give me a, ha a hand in this. Uh, the current level for space applications are in the order of kilorads. Am I right? Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. So 100 kilorad, we are about here. So at around this level, we see that we can still see a viable read, let's say a reading window. Viable reading window, of course, depends then on your uh, decoder, your reading mechanisms in output, your sense amplifier. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out is that uh, depending on how much you, uh, for how long you programmed your devices, so in this case you see, let's go back for a moment, we see here these different times that are the pulse for the program, and we see the same here, okay, 200, 800, 1,400. We see that this has a strong effect on the beginning of our curves, so of the beginning of the starting stage of our storage mechanisms. And uh, we see also that if you see here uh, on the x-axis, we have the programming uh, pulse time in microseconds, and here you have the current, and then you have different level of irradiation. We see that this, sorry, this advantage that we created and this linearity that uh, is uh, created by depositing charge is preserved across uh, irradiation mechanisms. And so this means that the, this is a very good way to uh, improve the reliability of your device. Of course, there are other trade-offs in here because programming for a, long, a longer time means uh, applying higher voltages for a longer time and so means degrading your device more. Or, on the other hand, means that it will be harder in the next arrays step to remove the charge from your device and thus the need for, again, longer pulse time to remove the charge from your device and again, reliability issues. Okay, so now to the new part of the talk. Let's see how it goes. Um, let's take again our specs that we discussed at the beginning. Okay, so we discussed endurance, data retention, and how do we prove uh, that these statements are held for our devices. Uh, let's start from data retention. 
And one thing that I wanted to ask you is, uh, there is an error in this slide, specifically regarding data retention. And I encourage you to find it. So there is an information missing specifically for this data retention. Do you have any idea? So we, see, we say we want to store our data for 10 years. At any condition? It doesn't specify the radiation environment, sure, of course. And, uh, but the radiation environment is too specific, so it's too specific to my field. So thank you. But uh, also, there is a more important uh, uh, factor missing here that is more common to all consumer and automotive electronics or whatever, whatever. Temperature. So we are missing the temperature here. So the temperature is an accelerator of aging mechanisms. And so if we specify that we want data retention for a certain amount of time, we always have to specify the temperature. In further lectures, I will not do this. I will put this information at the beginning. Um, so, okay, so we want to uh, prove that we can hold the data retention for 10 years at 125 degrees. How do we do this? So I think that this is, okay, you should be able to tell me this at, uh, uh, at this stage. What do you do to accelerate aging? Higher temperatures, okay? So we bake, we bake, okay? So, uh, but first, one thing first, actually, so we need to specify a specific failure condition for our bit cells, because so far, we have discussed uh, that after a certain stress, in this case was radiation, could be temperature, we have a decrease in performance in our, uh, let's say, uh, reading window. But we don't know what's the level here in which our sense amplifier will fail to reconstruct the information. So, Okay, let's define it then. So this is an engineering problem. So we have circuitry uh, uh, on the valley. As I was saying before, we have this differential bit cell. So we have one transistor here, one transistor here. We call them true bar. We could call them Franz and Haas. It doesn't matter. Um, uh, and so I take this plot. It's not really true. So this is the same bit cell before and after program. But let's consider as it were two different bit cells. One has been programmed here in orange and one hasn't been programmed here in uh, blue. Uh, and here we have the reading window. Actually, what I can tell you is that in our product, uh, it's not the difference between these two current that matters. It's actually the ratio between these two currents that matter. So I get to define today the failure mechanism. So if the ratio between the two currents at reading voltage for our device is less than 95%, so this bar current is uh, more than 95% than uh, uh, the value of the true current, then we have a fail. Not only this, we need to specify one other thing that relates to statistics. So, and here we have our information here. So, uh, what kind of um, amount of our distribution can we tolerate to fail? Okay, so um, let's take another picture that can explain this better. Okay, so here you see, uh, maybe I'll do it with the mouse. Uh, you see, this is a ga standard Gaussian current, let's say. So we have an average and we have sigmas, so standard deviation. How many sigmas do we take? Okay, and in this case, we have, I can tell you because this is just an engineering decision, let's say. Uh, we take uh, nine sigma in this case because we want our uh, upper boundary of our distribution to be 
lower than 95%. So we guarantee that at least the nine sigma under that upper boundary are below that segment so that we can reconstruct our value. So, okay, so uh, remember this 4.5 sigma because it's calculated like this, like from the uh, midpoint to the upper level uh, in our subsequent analysis. So instead of discussing about nine sigma, we discuss about 4.5 in this case. So here I added a little description in case I give you the slides later. Uh, okay, so we bake. Okay, we bake, we bake a different temperature, and we see uh, how many sigmas we see before a failure that we defined very rigidly, okay? So we see that, for example, uh, for uh, 225 degrees, we can bake our uh, array of pizzas, our statistics of pizzas up to 500 hours, and we see that at least we don't see a failure from our average of our true to bar ratio in this case uh, up to plus 4.68 sigma. Okay. Um, okay, but then how to connect this to our actual lifetime at 125 degrees. So this is just an exercise. So this is uh, quite established in industry. We use the Arrhenius equation. Okay, so um, Arrhenius, Mr. Arrhenius at the end of the 19th century stated that uh, especially chemical reactions, uh, the rate of the chemical reactions at different temperatures can be correlated uh, via this equation. So essentially, um, you see the description below, I will just read it out loud. Uh, the time T1 is the aging time required at a temperature, temperature 1, to simulate a service life of time 2 at a temperature, temperature 2. In particular, this T1 is our baking time, so the baking hours. Uh, the temperature one is the temperature at which we are baking in Kelvin. <laughs> so another trick here, <laughs> remember your units because they will fuck you up. Um, and uh, um, to have our uh, lifetime, so T2 of 10 years at uh, the temperature T2, 125 degrees. Okay, so then what else is missing here? Okay, B, uh, uh, Boltzmann constant, and EA, activation energy specifically related to this failure mechanism. Um, we don't have this. Okay, so let's just do this something first. Uh, I don't like it this way. We do some elaboration, mathematical elaboration. Very quickly, uh, whatever is constant, I take it out. And so you see this, this parameter A is not, uh, in principle, a fitting parameter, but is tightly related to our quantities. So it's just to have our baking time related to our baking temperature, and then have some plots that are more easily understandable. Okay, so one thing is missing the activation energy. Uh, how do we extrapolate the activation energy from all this? Okay, let's do this. So we bake at different temperature uh, and we have our threshold and we record the time at which we see the failure. Okay, so here we have some points that relate to a time of failure at a specific temperature. And we have four points. So this is why we didn't bake at only one temperature at the beginning, but at four different temperatures, because it made the recovery of the activation energy uh, much better. So what we do later, I'm very proud of this very small uh, animation. Um, uh, so this, w um, watch out for this X axis. So in the X here, we don't have the temperature. We have already uh, one over KT temperature. And so if you see here, we have this point at 175 degrees, this at 200, this at 225, and this at 250. 
and they correspond exactly to this transition. So this higher point is not 250, but is actually the smaller. So if we want to take a look in the next slides, you will see another plot. If we want to take a look at the result at 125 degrees, we'll have to look to the right of this plot. Um, okay, so, uh, and then we trace a line here, logarithmic uh, uh, plot, uh, here, I just recalled what I said. Uh, here, you remember this equation, logarithmic plot, and we obtain that our EA is exactly 1.45 electron volt for this failure mechanism. Uh, I cheated right now. So there is one information that is not matching exactly what we said before. Remember the failure mechanism? I will show you the failure, the exact failure uh, criteria that we set. There we go. Okay, so our true to bar ratio has to be lower than 95%. If we cross this 95%, we have a failure. Is it readable? I hope it is. Okay, so uh, if you don't have any inputs, but if you want to think a little bit more, I can let you think about it, but I can tell you immediately, we cheated with the threshold. So here we have a threshold that doesn't respect our criteria. Why? Because here we are baking 1,000 baking hours, okay? And we need to do this. So our criteria doesn't meet a viable, um, experimental setup that could create a, a way to speed up the process of characterizing what is going on and to prove our specification. Okay, so does it hold? So, or doesn't it? Um, there is one thing that comes into play here. So this uh, Arrhenius uh, equation and these Arrhenius plots are specified originally for chemical processes, but what has been seen is that uh, uh, it can correlate to specific failure mechanisms in electronics as well. This is why it's still used. Um, in our specific case, it relates to one specific, very determined physical effect, the detrapping of charge from the spacer out. Okay, so uh, how much energy do we need to overcome those potential barriers that I showed you at the very beginning, okay? And this is actually something in which uh, our community of engineers can come in to help. And so from literature, we know that this effect has a peak at 145 electron volt and then has some, let's say, it's not always perfect, of course, so you get different numbers. Uh, I am not entirely sure, I have to be honest, if this reference is correct. Uh, this relates to photoluminescence uh, in silicon nitride. Uh, and in my opinion, it holds because it's exactly related to the uh, photoelectric effect. So the specific energy that you need in order to make uh, an electron to escape. But um, prove me wrong. Um, okay, so we understood, let's say, what did we do? So we recovered an activation energy with this mechanism, uh, cheating on the threshold to accelerate our experiments. Uh, in order to get to a faster result, we obtain a result that we kind of agree with. So let's see, let's see, let's say that this is okay for our analysis. And so, um, that this is respected. So what is missing in all this? Endurance, okay? So now we proved data retention. Let's see if we can prove endurance, okay? So essentially, uh, I'm cheating a lot. I chose exactly the level of endurance that led to the exact result of the peak, 
and this was a lucky cherry pick. No, it was cherry picking, it was no luck at all. But if we take different, le if we repeat this exact process at different levels of endurance for this specific device, and even changing our threshold across the way would have been nicer, to be honest, this was not my data set, but would have been nicer at least to keep the threshold of the testing constant. Uh, we obtain results that are, uh, let's say, all in the ballpark of our original number that represents from our bibliography the effect of the trapping. Okay. So, uh, now we recovered our activation energy. We recover for all various levels of endurance cycles, at least for e square prompts, so up to a thousand cycles of program and arrays. We can try to, okay, so we have a dependency. This is, let's say, it's varying a little bit, but it's around the number that we obtain from literature. Uh, and we can go back to our plots and our baking time. Okay, so we see that uh, this is the plot where we can plot our traces with this uh, Arrhenius equation. Uh, and we can obtain then the, uh, how do we prove then that our uh, bit cells can withstand uh, up to a thousand cycles and uh, uh, more than 10 years. Well, essentially here, the extrapolation of these lines, that is exactly the Arrhenius plot, um, uh, means that at this level here, if you remember before I mentioned 125 degrees, so at 125 degrees, we need more than 10 years, that is represented by the green line, to uh, fail our uh, our uh, quality criteria, let's say. Okay, we can go back. We now have a lot more data, uh, and we take a look at the results, let's say. So, uh, given our activation energy that we recovered, um, uh, here you have the temperature, here you have 1 over kT, just a number, don't consider this column, this is not so necessary. But we can then predict how much time we need to fail our uh, criteria uh, at specific temperatures to obtain reliability at 10 years, 125 degrees. Because we can identify this point of crossing between these two lines. Okay, so this needs to be above. Our line, our Arrhenius plots needs to be above that line. Okay, so let's take some examples, not all of them because it would be boring, but let's take, for example, 100 uh, endurance cycles. Uh, if we take a bake uh, at uh, 250 degrees, uh, what is the bake time that our memory has to withstand in order to make sure that at 125 degrees instead, we sustain 10 years? And with this activation energy extracted, we get 1.3 hours. Okay, so more than 4.5, uh, our average plus 4.5 sigma of our distribution needs to be under 95%, at least for 1.3 hours at 250 degrees. So we see here, bake time one hour, we have 7.35 sigma of failure. We go on, three, we already passed, so we've already won. We see a failure actually at 500 hours, okay? So this means that our failure criteria is not respected only at 500 hours of bake time, which means that uh, this criteria is plenty and respected. And this has to ha hold for all the cases, for all the activation energy extracted, for all the temperatures, for all the uh, distributions. Okay, so now we can use it. Okay, so we got to know what is going on. Uh, you characterized more or less your technology. Uh, you know what is going on. You know that it holds uh, 
uh, you're, you're proving your specs, as per the title. Um, how do we use it? Okay, so um, we take, uh, we go with our chips into production, okay? And we bake them for, uh, how much is it? I think this is five hours at uh, 250 degrees. So during production testing, you bake them for five hours at 250 degrees. Um, let's say in this plot, I set a dot at 10 to the power of minus one hours just to represent my zero. This is not ideal because it makes this point to wobble quite a little bit, depending on where you set the zero. But let's just use it to at least to understand what is going on with your production data. Um, okay, so then we extrapolate from this trend our failure criteria at 95% for our production data. And we go to the Arrhenius plot. We obtain a single point here. So at a certain uh, uh, temperature of bake, we obtain a certain time. I'm sorry. Uh, we obtain a certain time that determines a failure. Um, we have some of our activation energy from the way that we characterize the process. Uh, so then we can plot our uh, lines in the same way as we did before. And we can see that from this point, they are above the passing the specs line. Okay, one thing that I neglected here. So uh, production test data. So the, the position of the zero that makes your point not very stable. Uh, here we are using only the program side because in production testing we need to make sure that it is possible to program all of your bit cells on both sides of your differential bit cell so you don't have in uh, true to bar ratio out of your production data but from the testing that we saw before we saw that well, for irradiation, and also it's true, I can tell you, for temperature, we hold the linearity uh, across stress, and also the uh, stress mechanism tend to bring back the program distribution back to your fresh state, but you have to sacrifice some accuracy here. So, um, we take the uh, fresh distribution, not stressed, we keep it constant, and we just see the variation of the program side. Of course, this means that you have ratios of averages and not averages of ratio, which is a mathematical mistake. Um, we are neglecting neighboring effects of our differential bit cell, uh, and we are taking uh, erasing and fresh distribution from a different set of data, of course. As I was mentioning before, we keep the fresh and we keep it constant. So, yeah, so we use it. We use it. We try to understand if this is a pejorative case. So, are these assumptions a pejorative case? What I can tell you is that uh, for sure this is. So, neglecting neighboring effects is actually a pejorative of your effects. And in this case, um, I'm, I don't recall, I didn't calculate this, so I might tell you something wrong. Let's put an asterisk on this, uh, just because this is simply mathematically wrong, but it's not straightforward uh, if it's pejorative or uh, bettering your case in analysis. Um, and uh, this, of course, also is not definitive, okay? So taking different sets does not ensure that you have a worst case. Because ideally, if you have to make sacrifice in, your, in the coherence of your analysis, at least you, make, you, you need to make sure that it's uh, um, an assumption that will worsen your conditions, not better them, because at least uh, otherwise you cannot ensure that your device is proving your specs, okay? So um, now this was just an exercise and of course it's not conclusive 
but it's a general reference for us to understand if at least you have multiple parameters, this is one tool out of many, and let's say uh, it needs to be taken with uh, some, um, I'm missing the words, with some uh, caution, let's say, okay. Okay, so next step, let's mix these two things. So now we have a way to determine if we are proving our specs. Uh, we have seen that we have a pejorative case for uh, irradiate that we, we can determine stress with irradiation. So let's do this with all temperatures, all levels of uh, uh, endurance uh, and uh, understanding if we get the same results. And I'm sorry to say that this is, will come next time. So I haven't got to that yet. So uh, the summary, and we are to the end of the lecture. Uh, okay, so just to summarize very quickly what we discussed, uh, the information is stored in the floating gate, modifying the voltage threshold. In our floating, in our charge-based devices, we store charge that changes the characteristic of our device. Radiation and also aging, actually, uh, tend to bring the voltage, the distribution of the um, state in which you uh, store the charge of your program state back to your, the neutral state without charge. Um, and this can lead to a concept for dosimeters. Uh, of course, never neglect all the surrounding circuitry of your circuit because otherwise you will mask potential failures uh, in your um, process of ensuring uh, something that works. Uh, you can absolute ha absolutely have alternative bit cells, both charge-based or not charge-based. Um, of course, changing bit cells, you can have uh, several parameters to uh, improve your uh, retention to radiation. In particular, we analyzed programming time with my experiment. Uh, of course, using or not charge-based bit cells is a matter of trade-off. What's your environment? How harsh is it? How, uh, uh, how, how much chance of reparability you get in space zero? Um, and so, and cost, of course. And then, let's say, the last part of the lecture was simply an exercise on how to prove your specs, given the specs that we gave for uh, non-volatile memories, for, um, for non-volatile memories in general. So that retention and endurance across lifetime. Thank you very much. Any questions?